From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Here's what's ahead. For this week's Cattle Market Insight, we turn to Lee Schultz of Iowa State University. Lee will share new information on retail beef prices, and he previews this week's USDA Cattle on Feed and Cattle Inventory reports. Then K-State's Jamie Lynn Farney will talk about forage options for you cattle producers to consider planting this fall to compensate for the anticipated shortage of harvested forage because of the drought. She'll go over the findings from her research on how well these planted forages serve as a nutritional option for the herd. And on this week's 4-H segment, K-State's Diane Mack talks with Jeff Wickman about the judging process at county fairs. Plus more here on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. It's good to have you aboard for another Agriculture Today here on the K-State Radio Network. We turn now to a livestock economist out of Iowa State University for this week's cattle market commentary, welcoming in via phone Lee Schultz from his office in Ames. If you were to describe this past trading week, largely quiet, Lee, maybe some exceptions here and there, but nothing really earth-shaking going on. For the week, we, we did settle a little bit lower when, when you look at live cattle futures and feeder cattle futures. I think that's a bit of the artifact of a slow cash week. Um, you've seen some bids at, at 110 early in the week and 108 by later in the week and, and relatively slow trade. Um, didn't help really the futures market materialize all that much. You're also not seeing much support from box prices. They're down about $3 for the week. And so you know, I think overall a relatively quiet week we're kind of post-holidays, especially when you look at, at 4th of July and, and a little bit too far out be, until Labor Day. So we are in that dog days of summer, and I think we're just going to kind of walk through these next couple of weeks unless we see some news that, that would really have the markets react to. If there's any spark at all in the markets, it would be on the feeder cattle side. If you look around the auctions, the strength there continues to be impressively. Really, when you when you look at May and June, you know that was the best sustained rise in, in prices of, of feeder cattle this year, and really pretty surprising given where a lot of the market fundamentals are. You see a lot of sale receipts from auctions, videos, uh, or even direct trade. So th- those cattle are moving, but but there's quite a bit of demand there. Um, you know, I think from a, a supply standpoint, we are in in a seasonally better time of of the year and so that's helping support prices definitely the grain situation is helping prices allows feedlots to to spend a little bit more for those calves um, as the cost of gain is quite a bit cheaper but we look at feeder cattle prices it's hard to justify those given what live cattle prices are both currently and those deferred contracts i think definitely those markets are offering some value um, and, and something producers need to start thinking about as we talk about fall marketing and production plans in protecting some of that value that's currently out there. You bet. Well, we've a number of odds and ends to go through this week, including the upcoming reports due out this Friday from the USDA, the monthly cattle on feed report, and the semi-annual cattle inventory report. We'll take those on in just a moment. Uh, There's new information on beef exports. By and large, the latest numbers would seem to be favorable. They are definitely a bright spot. Um, now, the, the, the caveat with a lot of the trade data, when we look at the official monthly data, we are lagged quite a bit. So we're still dealing with the, the May 2018 as the most current data. So a lot of the fireworks that's happened with uh, trade disputes and all of that, we haven't seen how the official data has come about because of those. But when you look at the first five months of the year, 
Beef trade, when we look at it at a carcass weight basis, is up 15% year to date. Star market has been South Korea. Uh, that's really not a surprise when we have Chorus, the U.S. Korean Free Trade Agreement. That has definitely helped flow to uh, South Korea so far this year. Um, you're also seeing Japan up 5% year to date, Mexico up 9% year to date, and even Canada up slightly. Uh, year to date. So definitely the international demand has been very positive for for our uh, prices here in the U.S. There's also information of note on the demand side, some new numbers on beef retail prices. What does that have to say and what is the significance of that data? So the Bureau of Labor Statistics, in combination with the, with USDA's Economic Research Service, releases every month a, a composite retail price. And so that, that's really looking across all prices, and it has some quantity adjustment to those prices, but it doesn't take into account featuring or, or special buy one, get one free, for example. So I like to use these prices as just kind of a barometer of, of where retail prices are, not, not the absolute value. But when we look at the most current data for June, uh, suggests that choice beef prices are up one and a half cents from May. Um, and so I think we are seeing very strong demand that we're able to support those higher prices, even with this uh, increase in beef production and beef being available. But to put it into context, we're about 25 cents lower than we were last time. So we are seeing the impact of more supplies. Uh, But short term, we're seeing pretty strong demand for that beef. So it reinforces what we've been watching for quite a while. The, The domestic beef scene is really doing quite well. Well, you look ahead to the Friday reports, cattle on feed out from the USDA. Now, last month, if memory serves, there was a bit of a, an unexpected turn on the placements side, higher than most had anticipated. What's the general drift of thinking right now for this report, Lee? Well, starting off with the placements, I think they're expected above a year ago. Um, we've seen larger feeder cattle imports from Mexico and Canada. We've seen really strong feeder cattle receipt activity. So I think we're seeing those cattle enter feedlots. Some of that is weather-related and dry conditions in some areas are pushing it into the feedlot at a little bit lighter weights. When we look at cattle marketed, I think we're about at a year ago levels. Um, Mostly that is because we have one less slaughter day in June 2018 compared to June 2017. In net, that puts us at, I'd say, around 4 to 5% compared to last year, up um, in the number of cattle on feed. Really, I think if, if any surprises from this report, it's going to be that placement number. Uh, we've been quite a bit surprised with higher placements the last couple of months, and, and so I think that's something really to watch and could be bearish, maybe not so much for the current markets, but as we looked at more deferred markets, if that placement number is quite a bit higher than expectations. Really, that is the question. At what point do these recurring months of higher placements become a concern in the market in as far as it remaining current over the next several months or so? Well, and a lot of the debate has been we, we've seen higher placements now be, because cattle are entering at lighter weights, and so that will ease numbers later on. And, and so in net, that will balance. We're really not adding to the, the number of, of cattle that we have. We're maybe just kind of moving them around a little bit, and it may change a little bit the marketing dates. Uh, but overall, you know, the expectation is the supply number we have is what we're going to be marketing in, into the future Um, You know, there there could be a a bit of surprise when we look at those cattle on feed reports because those don't take into account the less than 1,000 head feedlots. Now, overall, those have been down quite a bit year over year because the economics, right, aren't there really to to walk that corn off the operation. But if, you know, for some reason we did start to see those pick up, those numbers could be inflated a little bit more as, as far as the number of cattle, and that could be a pressure point on the market. Well, we'll see what that cattle on feed report holds when it comes out Friday, as does the cattle inventory report, which has been reinstated for midsummer now. And, Lee, of course, this is a major indicator of cattle herd expansion or contraction or stability. What are you thinking in terms of what this report might tell us? 
Well, I, I'm sure glad we, we have the report. Um, you know, it's been especially important the last several years is there really been a lot of dynamic changes, especially when you look at, at that breeding herd and as we've been expanding. And now I think expectations that, that that expansion is definitely slowing, but how fast is that slowing and, and maybe has it all but stopped? When you look at the, the January report, a lot of times we're kind of benchmarking off, off of that report because that gave us a signal for what 2018 was going to be. There was expectations there that the heifer replacements we're going to see 5% fewer uh, that we're going to calve. We still did see beef cow numbers up year over year, but that's a lot because we're really seeing a relatively young cow herd and not a real, lot of need to really cull the older animals that, that we do have. I think Really, when you put it all together, um, I think we're, we're going to see numbers, especially for the heifers for beef cow replacement, are going to be lower than a year ago just because um, they were so high the last several years. Beef cow numbers are, are still likely to be higher than, than a year ago, um, as really culling rates haven't caught up yet. But the number that, that I think a lot of us are going to be watching, um, and it relates to the cattle on feed reports, is that feeder cattle outside of feedlots. So that gives us an indication of what hasn't entered feedlots yet. That number, I think, could really play into what this fall feeder cattle market really does look like. We get that monthly update of, of cattle on feed. Um, that gives us some pretty good indications what's placed and when it's going to be marketed. But to understand that pipeline supply of feeder cattle is going to be very important um, and understand, you know, when are those potentially going to come to market um, and how that could impact prices, depending on how large that number is. So we have two important reports coming out this Friday. Is that to suggest then that as we look at the trading days ahead of us, the markets will spend a fair amount of time positioning ahead of those new numbers? I think really that that's definitely the case. You know, unless we see a lot of other factors impacting the market, but there's really not so much foreseen now, I think we're going to be really trading those reports, both pre-report and then definitely that following week post-report. I think we'll see some dynamics as markets will further react to them. Lee, we appreciate your observations. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you. That's Lee Schultz, livestock economist at Iowa State University, offering up his thinking on the cattle market trends here on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test, fix, save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Next up on Agriculture Today, thoughts for you producers who are worried about the availability of adequate forage for your cattle herd heading into the fall and winter. Well, there is the option, of course, of planting a standing crop in the fall for grazing as a forage resource. And we want to bring in now a beef systems specialist, K-State Research and Extension, who has studied this closely over the recent years, Jamie Lynn Farney. So, Jamie Lynn, here we are once again talking about the worries about hay and other forages being in short supply. Where would you start in offering some alternatives to producers? It kind of depends on what your plan is. Once again, there's really not one recipe to fit everybody's goals. Mm -hmm. So if you currently have some open wheat ground and you're looking to catch some of those August rains, you can plant some very fast-growth spring varieties like spring oats, spring barley, and maybe a radish or turnip in early to mid-August to be able to graze early in that fall through first part of November. Now, those spring varieties, once it starts cooling down, they're going to quit producing for you. But in um, some of our research projects, we've seen that those spring varieties planted in August, catching at least one rain on them, can produce within 40 days after planting 
weighs anywhere between 1,200 pounds up to a ton of grass on a dry matter basis per acre. In our studies, our radishes also have outproduced our turnips. So that kind of offers a little bit extra forage for you. Now, I do have to be cognizant of those brassicas, the radish and turnip, or kale, or colliards. Those things are very opportunistic. If we get a lot of rain and there's some residual nitrogen and it's pretty warm, they will outcompete your grasses. Hmm. That's really not a huge problem for cows, but for your weaned calves, that could become a potential issue. Weaned calves really are fairly adverse to the brassicas, especially in those first couple of weeks, and definitely pre-freeze. And you could significantly hamper gains until a freeze when they actually go to eating those brassicas. So if you're looking to put weaned calves out on this early fall grazer, I recommend a maximum of about a pound of that brassica seed just so it doesn't completely overwhelm your grass species. The other thing is I actually just completed last fall a preference study looking at which of these covers as an early fall option do cattle like and which ones are they fairly adverse to. And in that study, I found that spring barley, which was my only grass species I had, was above and beyond their most favorite forage that was out there for them to consume. The second thing was actually a tie between Austrian winter pea and a forage cultivar specific radish. They really didn't like the pea or the radish, but it was still better than the other options that they had. Hmm. Uh, The other options they had were mustard, collard, purple top turnip, and kale. Of that list, kale was above and beyond their least favorite forage out there. Would one want to look at a cocktail, if you will, a mixture of these forages? We've talked about that as a cover crop alternative before. Are you recommending that in large part here, Jamie Lynn? With the potential for no moisture, you know, where we're, we're being on the far negative mm-hmm. on this perspective right now, mm-hmm. a mixture is a little more advisable than what I generally recommend. Just because, and my research has shown that our our grass species and those brassicas kind of respond slightly differently to environmental conditions. Our grass species actually were a little more tolerant to the drought than the brassicas were. But if you did get some rains, those brassicas will grow like crazy. And in regards to our, our fall and winter mixtures... And not getting any rain, I would not incorporate any legumes into those fall mixtures. We rarely see an appreciable amount of growth with those fall legumes, and they're one of the most expensive seeds. And they actually need quite a bit more moisture than the other two categories, grass or brassica. So in a drought situation, I would probably stay away from the fall legumes. Once again, though, several early, early fall options here for planting in August. And as we get deeper into the season, some of these same alternatives could be planted following, say, corn harvest or soybean harvest. That's something that producers ought to be contemplating as well, what they might put on their row crop acreage after harvest then, right? Uh, Yes. After your corn harvest, if you are looking to wait and graze, After November through maybe February time frame, something like triticale could be a good option for that time frame. Based on its growth pattern, that's when it should be at its optimal production. Depending on variety, you might even have another spring flush. Another option, and actually, you know, because we're we're still kind of talking on a drought perspective. Right. Even after your corn, planting wheat or... And I know if you're in wheat country, you don't like hearing the word rye, (laughs) but 
those two options, there's a little slower growth and have through the winter time frame, then we'll have a huge flush February through May. They are a little less drought sensitive than, say, our spring varieties we were talking about. That wheat and rye, they can go without, you know, as long as they get emerged, they can go for a while without any moisture, but as long as they get a little bit over the winter and get some rain in the spring, you can have some grazable forage. Jamie Lynn, it's something that producers could take advantage of, even though the idea of a cover crop for grazing purposes still may be new to a number of people. It's really showing up well in recent years as a a good prospect for forage production, according to your work. Yes, it offers a a very, very high-quality forage. And actually, from a quality perspective, if you just have dry, pregnant cows out on a cover crop pasture, if there is adequate forage out there, um, it actually is offering way more protein and way more energy than their requirements demand. And so another way to extend the amount of forage for those cows is once again utilizing limit grazing or strip grazing. So by limit grazing, um, this is actually some information that I had learned from Oklahoma State. You can allow those cows to be on this high-quality forage three times a week for about four hours each of those days. And then the rest of the time, those dry pregnant cows just need to be on dormant native range, corn stalks, junk hay, something that is more of a filler than anything. Your cows will maintain appropriate condition and... You essentially can stock or be able to run three times as many cows on your ground by just allowing it to be a supplement versus their entire dietary meal. The other option is strip grazing. Colleagues out of Nebraska have done quite a bit with strip grazing. It was on pivots, and they put hot fence on their pivot in a circle, and allowed the pivot to only move X distance every day. And so those cows only had access to forage to meet requirements. And they were able to maintain cow condition and productivity on that and were able to extend the amount of total grazing days above just grazing that cover crop without rotation, without strip, without using it as a supplement. We have just scratched the surface of the work that you've been doing along with others at K-State in cover crop performance as a forage for cattle. And if a producer would like to see the numbers that you and your colleagues have gathered, how might they access those? Uh, One of the quickest ways you can see some of the tonnage and composition, what things have grown, go to the Southeast Research and Extension Center annual report. It can be found on our website. Or contact your local extension office. If they haven't seen some of the information, they know how to get in contact with me to be able to help answer some of these questions. And uh, we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Jamie Lynn. Thank you, Eric. Jamie Lynn Farney. She's a beef systems specialist, K-State Research and Extension, and producers as you contemplate the possibilities of planting any of these forage crops, uh, grazing forage for the upcoming early fall or fall and winter proper, do look into the information that's available through K-State. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we'll return shortly on the K-State Radio Network. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reached thousands of Kansans in more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu.
Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Welcome back. Eric Atkinson here. Now a quick glance at today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. And as first shared with us here on the broadcast last Friday by the Farm Service Agency's Rod Winkler, the Kansas FSA has announced that 43 Kansas counties are now authorized for emergency haying and grazing of Conservation Reserve Program acres beginning today. These counties stretch roughly from far south central Kansas into central, east central, and northeast Kansas and include two counties in far southeast Kansas and one in far southwest Kansas. Emergency haying in these counties will end on August the 15th, emergency grazing authorized through September the 30th. Now, the emergency use does not include CP25, and there will be no CRP rental payment reductions for emergency haying or grazing. Producers in eligible counties can use CRP for their own livestock, or they can grant another livestock producer use of their CRP. The same CRP acres cannot be both hayed and or grazed at the same time. For example, if half a field is hayed, the other half cannot be grazed. Only one cutting of hay is permitted, and none of that hay can be sold. Now, to see a map of the Kansas counties authorized for this emergency CRP use, you can go to the state FSA website. That's www.fsa.usda.gov. And, of course, to handle all the details on taking advantage of this opportunity, pay a visit to your local USDA service center and your FSA personnel there. A vote on a motion to proceed to conference on the Farm Bill is expected this week in the House, according to House Agriculture Committee Chairman Mike Conaway. Conaway said he is currently working on the list of conferees and is putting together all the committees that might have jurisdictional linkage to the deal, as he said. Conaway said he's anticipating that Democrats will offer at least one motion to instruct conferees to consider a particular position as negotiations get underway. Ag Committee Ranking Member Colin Peterson is aiming to make that non-binding suggestion be the establishment of baseline funding for a vaccine disease bank at the USDA. A top Democratic farm senator said the House bill includes food stamp work requirements that the Senate will not accept. Senate Agriculture Ranking Member Debbie Stabenow said last week she wants the House to understand current law and that there are already work requirements in place for recipients of the SNAP program payments. She said that they want more older people to work, they want more moms with smaller children to work, and that's a disagreement, she says, that the Senate has. The USDA will have a difficult job figuring out how much of any financial damage farmers are suffering is actually due to trade actions, and those damage figures will be key to any compensation plan for those producers. The USDA's Gary Crawford has more. Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue has said this several times over the last couple of weeks. He repeated it Friday on his Georgia tour. If we can't have some resolution on trade by Labor Day, then we need to look at uh, mitigation procedures and protections for ag producers. But to do that, you have to estimate how much of any price movement for any crop was actually due to the trade disruption and not a dozen other factors. It is going to be very difficult to estimate. Ohio State University ag economist Carl Zuloff says for one thing. We've never really been in this situation. Now, of course. We have econometric procedures, analytical procedures that can give us some idea but it's really going to be hard. And he says once you get a damaged number, especially as early as Labor Day... It's a number that's going to have a lot of uncertainty around it. Zuloff said just as it does with certain disaster payments, USDA could decide to give producers a partial compensation payment early on, another later as markets and trade systems settle down and adjust to the new tariff situation. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. And in the debate over which agency should take the lead in regulating cell-cultured meat products, the Food and Drug Administration on Thursday laid out its long history overseeing cell culture products ranging from pharmaceuticals to yogurt. The FSA and the USDA share duties on food inspection, with the FDA overseeing as much as 80% of food products. But USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service is taking charge of traditional meat products, such as beef, pork, 
pork and poultry. The advent of cell-cultured meat has created a regulatory turf battle, as cell-cultured companies want the FDA in charge, while traditional livestock groups want the USDA in charge. Opening up a hearing on this last week, FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb alluded to the notion that agricultural technology has outpaced regulators' understanding of the science. He also noted that the risks of cell-cultured meat products differ from traditionally harvested meat products. Susan Maine, the Director of Food Safety and Applied Nutrition at FDA, said that that agency already has been working with the cell-cultured industry for several years as the startup firms start prepping for regulatory approval and market access. Coming your way now, the weekly feature from the Kansas Forest Service at K-State, Tree Tales. Here's K-State Forester Charlie Barden. Did you know that a properly functioning windbreak may also increase crop yields? Windbreaks and shelter belts were originally promoted across the Great Plains in response to the incredible wind erosion which occurred during the Dust Bowl era of the 1930s. Windbreaks have been successful in reducing wind erosion, and a number of studies done some years ago found that the fields protected by a windbreak also had higher yields than unprotected fields. Several farmers have told me that fields protected on the north and west side produce better wheat crops, and that fields protected from the drying south and west winds produce higher corn and bean yields. I recently conducted a study here in Kansas and did find positive effects on yield for wheat and soybeans on many fields. In fact, soybeans growing behind a windbreak showed significant yield increases about 46% of the time, with an average yield increase of 16%. Wheat was a bit less responsive, with yield responses 30% of the time, with a 10% increase. These results were based on 163 crop yield seasons. I am now looking to expand the study across the region from Texas to Nebraska on all crops and in particular want to get more data from cornfields to assess the effect windbreaks have on crop yields. If you have combine yield data files and you would like to participate in this new study, please send me an email at cbarden, C-B-A-R-D-E-N, at ksu.edu or give me a call at 785-532-1444. If your field is a good candidate for the study, I will send you out a flash drive to transfer data on, and you can mail it back to me. If you have a lot of data, we will even come out to work with you to get it safely exported onto our system. Again, my email is cbarden at ksu.edu, and phone number is 785-532-1444 if you would like to learn more about this study. You will listen to Tree Tales. I'm Charles Barden, a forester with KC8 Research and Extension. Thanks, Charlie, and the best of luck with that expanded research on that topic. We'll be back in just a few minutes. This is Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, Call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services, exploring options, generating solutions. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. County fair season is underway across Kansas, and creating a positive experience for 4-H youth is a top priority. Judging animals and exhibits is a vital part of the county fair educational process, and judges are asked to keep four important words in mind. Fair, firm, friendly, and consistent. Northeast Area 4-H Specialist Diane Mack provides an overview of the judging process. Diane, 4-H is a huge part of all county fairs, and one of the things we want to focus on today is the judging aspect of this, because that does play a large role for the 4-H members. Yes, it does. And so what I'd first like to do is invite everybody to get down to their county fair because it's such a community event and to support their young people in their community. But that judging process, they'll go out and see those ribbons. Well, what actually happened before that ribbon was put on that exhibit? And so I want to kind of go through that process. And again, to stress that this is only one aspect of the 4-H year, but it is a great aspect for the young person to be able to sit down with the judge and learn how they can improve, or what they'll do for next year. What we like to happen with the judging process is that they actually sit down with a judge, and we call that conference judging. And so what that does is help that young person, number one, to be able to speak to an adult about their project, so the communication skills, and they be able to articulate, you know, what happened within the process of developing their project 
and the improvement and, and what they could do better or what they could learn for next year. There are so many different things that are judged throughout the county fair. I think of all of the things that I see in the exhibit halls. So this is really a need for a wide range of judges. Yes, we look for those content specialist judge. So if I know foods, then I would come and judge the foods. If I know clothing, then I would do clothing. And so, yes, they are looking for people, and especially with the livestock industry, they're looking for people who are either related to the university or, you know, raise animals themselves. And sometimes these are people who have gone through the forage programs themselves. Yes, many of them have, or they've been involved as a volunteer or leader for many years, and so they're very familiar with it. So we do want to stress, too, that the judge is using a standard or a scorecard that's been developed by usually university folks who know that content of whatever it is. And so they have that in their head or they actually have that scorecard in front of them as they work through that judging process. Can you run through the ribbons and kind of let us understand a little bit better what that ranking is? Right. So in the 4-H division, we call it the Danish system. All exhibits receive a ribbon. And so they're placed in that purple, blue, red, and white categories. Again, they're judged, first of all, against that standard and not against each other. So when the judge goes through there and looks at the standard and talks with that young person, purple is outstanding in all aspects of that exhibit through looking at that standard. Then the blue exceeds the minimum standard but may have a few minor flaws. Red meets those minimum standards and obvious improvements need to be made. And then that white basically says it's not a bad exhibit, it just fails to meet those standards. In a judge's mind, what they're going to start is the average is that red ribbon, and then they'll go up to that blue or purple, and then they'll think about going down to the white ribbon. Also then, if there's a grand champion or champion selected, they'll do first against the standard, and then they're going to compare them against the other exhibits. With beef or swine, and what will be great there too, is the audience will be able to learn and hear those standards because that judge has that ideal standard in his head, he or she, and then will ever explain that. But usually what happens with a livestock show is that he'll immediately place those against each other because they're usually lined up from that champion of the class to the blues, reds, and whites. In terms of the animals, it's really fun to be part of the crowd because you really do learn a lot. You do, and that's a great way to help learn about the industry and see what they're actually looking for in those animals, whether it be for a market animal or for breeding. And so if you are a person who is in the animal industry, you could go and learn and say, what is the industry looking for now in the breeding aspect of it? What I'd really kind of like to do is work through that. What does it look like for that conference judging process when a judge sits down with a young person And basically, first of all, the judge is trying to make that young person feel at ease because it is kind of hard to talk to that adult that you don't know. And so just kind of having that introductory phase. And then they're going to kind of work through some questions. So first of all, they're going to say, you know, well, how did you make this? Or why did you choose to make this item? And then maybe what was hard about it? What was easy about it? And then for them to help look at it and say, what would you do differently? Would there be anything you would do differently? And then think about Maybe it's a bread item. How would you serve this item? Or who would you share this with in the community? Or if it's a piece of furniture, how is that piece of furniture going to look in their home as well? So that's kind of the conversations that's going on. And then that judge will probably pick out some things and say, well, this is where I see that improvements can be made. This is where I see you've done a great job. And this is the ribbon that you'll be getting today. Overall, a positive experience. And I think that's what's good because it is always encouraging. Yes. First thing you know, that judge, again, tries to make that young person feel at ease because it is a little difficult to talk to somebody, and especially the younger seven and eight-year-olds. When I judge, I really just try to do some introductory things. How are you doing today? How's it going? And then, you know, start to talk about their project. And when they're really talking about it, you know, it, it just helps that they're forgetting about other things and then can concentrate on what they did. Probably feel like they're going to the principal's office when it first starts, right? (laughs) Well, right. They could feel that way because they are asking the judge for their opinion. They have to remember parents and families need to understand that because you are asking for some person's opinion when you bring it to judge. So that's a part of the learning as well. Maybe it didn't turn out exactly the way you, you wanted it to, but all ribbon ratings are important and that learning process, you know, for next time is important. That's really the key is to improve from year to year. And I think that's what all of the 4-H members are striving for is to get better in their project areas. Right. And I, what I like to do um, when I'm judging is actually what ribbon would you give it? After we've kind of had some discussions and then, you know, they can see, well, yeah, I would have maybe done this or that. And then they can understand that they're a judge, too. But I think it is important then whatever the ribbon rating for the parent to feel supportive and say, well, 
you know, you didn't quite do uh, as well this time, but we'll look for next time and we can always improve. That's Northeast Area 4-H Specialist Diane Mack. To learn more about 4-H judging, visit kansas4h.org. And here's a list of county fairs being held over the next 7 to 10 days. The Marshall County Fair continues through tomorrow in Blue Rapids. The Woodson County Fair in Yates Center and Jewell County Fair in Mankato end on Wednesday. The Bourbon, Grant, and Ellis County Fairs in Fort Scott, Ulysses, and Hayes run through Saturday. Gove, Gray, Kearney, Kiowa, Rice, Rollins, Comanche, Logan, Sheridan, and Stanton have fairs opening multi-day runs today. Tomorrow, county fairs begin in Ottawa and Washington counties. Then on Wednesday, Clay, Lane, Scott, Sedgwick, Stafford, McPherson, and Reno counties have fairs opening. On Thursday, fairs open in Clark, Elk, Franklin, Ford, Neosho, and Smith counties. The Hamilton County Fair begins on Friday. On Saturday, fairs open in Haskell, Labette, Miami, and Morris counties. And on Sunday, the Meade County Fair begins in Meade. A complete list of county fairs can be found online at kansas4h.org under the What's Hot heading. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.